Um, it's now officially noon, so good afternoon. Um, everyone, my name is Dr. Jamie Lavalle. I'm a professor here at the University of Saskatchewan Law, and I'm also a Muskeg Lake Cree Nation citizen. I am pleased to welcome you to the Culliton Lecture in Criminal Law, which is our third lecture in the 2022-2023 academic year. Um, as we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Um, I'm going to clear up a couple other administrative details. One is, again, please feel free to enter the door prize um, if, you, if you haven't already. Um, you can also enter um, after the lecture is, is done, and the prize will be drawn um, later today. Um, we may have a Q&A session if time is available. If there is, though, please state your name before asking your question. Um, and now we get on to like the, I would like to thank McCurcher LLP for sponsoring our lecture. There's a little contingency over here, I believe, right? And I don't mean contingency fees, I mean a little group right here, okay? Uh, so I'd like to thank McCurcher LLP for sponsoring our lecture series, which allows the college to continue to present a wide range of informative, educational, and entertaining speakers to the law school community and self-described old dogs, who I guess have new tricks to tell us. Um, and then I would also like to take a moment to thank members of the judiciary for joining us today, and I may butcher people's names, so please uh, bear with me. I'm, I tried to ask, so let's see. Chief Justice Popescu? Close? Good. Court of Queen's ben ben Bench, and then Justice Court of Qu King's Bench. <laughs> right? Did I say Queen's? Okay, yeah. And it actually says King's here, so just so used to it, right, after, you know, it's not like I'm 70 years old, but my entire life has been the queen, right? Um, the queen's bench, so. And then Justice Richard uh, Danieluk, great. And Judge um, B.S. Mitchell, okay, great. Didn't even have to tell them to put up their hands, guys, so that's good. Um, so the Culliton Lecture in Criminal Law is funded by an endowment from the Law Society of Saskatchewan, which was established in 1981 to honor E.M. Culliton. Edward Milton Culliton earned an arts degree from the University of Saskatchewan in 1926 and a law degree in 1928. In 1935, he was elected as a liberal member of the Saskatchewan legislature representing the constituency of Gravelberg. Just making sure there wasn't any Gravelberg people that wanted to do this, right? Um, and was re-elected in 1938. He served as provincial secretary from 1938 to 1941. He was appointed to the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal in 1951 and from 1961 to 1981, served as Chief Justice of the Court. He was also Chancellor of the University from 1965 to 1968. In 1981, he was made a Companion of the Order of Canada, and in 1988, he was awarded the Saskatchewan Order of Merit. So the idea is that this person has done a lot of stuff in their life, and now they get an endowed chair, <laughs> right? But also don't forget, last week, the $2 million for the ST chair was also what happened for that one. So again, if you guys have $3 million, let us know, <laughs> okay? And then now I'd like to introduce George Green, again, from the McCurcher LLP um, area. Uh, George is a proud alumni of the College of Law, <laughs> right, where he received his Bachelor's of Laws with distinction in, and they're dating you here, 2002. Yeah, so George is a partner in the Saskatoon office, so the Saskatoon McCurcher office, where he practices extensively in the areas of employment law, debt recovery, and criminal defense. So George will come forward and introduce our, our speaker, and then once that, once the speaker is finished, if there's time, we'll do a Q&A. We'll then get the student to give a gift, and then I will once again thank everybody for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I also see Justice Bardai, Justice Sherman, uh, prominent defense lawyers Mark Brayford and uh, Brian Pfefferly, so uh, thanks. thank you all for coming here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Michael Muldaver, and uh, his CV is a little more impressive than mine, so I'm going to go over it for you. <laughs> Justice Muldaver attended the University of Toronto where he earned a Bachelor of Arts in 1968 and uh, he got his Bachelor of Laws in 1971. 
he was the gold medalist, so right there, he's got me. <laughs> uh, Justice Moldaver articled with the law firm of Thompson Rogers, uh, and it was then with Mr. G. Arthur Martin, and he was called to the bar in Ontario in 1973. He began his criminal law practice with Pomerant, Pomerant, and Greenspan, that later became known as Greenspan, Gold, and Moldaver. He became a partner there in 1975. Justice Moldaver was awarded his Queen's Counsel designation in 1985, and after practicing as a sole practitioner for two years, he became affiliated with the law firm of Goodman and Goodman, and that was from 1988 until his appointment to the bench. Well in practice, Justice Moldaver was the director of the Criminal Lawyers Association. Uh, he was the director of the Advocates Society and co-chair of the University of Toronto Academic Tribunal, which was the discipline subsection. He co-chaired the 1989 Advocacy Symposium at Massey Hall, as well as the 1990 Advocacy Symposium at Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, which featured a panel composed of the Canadian Chief Justice Dixon, U.S. Chief Justice Rehnquist, and U.K. Lord Chancellor McKay. This will be the second half of this uh, introduction here. <laughs> We're in the 90s now. <laughs> Justice Moldaver began his judicial career as a member of the High Court of Justice for Ontario, where he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Ontario in 1990. He was elevated to the Court of Appeal in 1995 and to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2011. Throughout his career, Justice Moldaver played an active role in the legal community, going back to the 70s now, from 1978 <laughs> to 1995, he co-taught criminal law courses at Osgoode Hall and at the University of Toronto. There we go, alumni. <laughs> He has acted as a speaker and instructor in numerous continuing education programs for both the judiciary and the profession, participating in educational programs sponsored by the National Judicial Institute, the Canadian Institute for the Administration of Justice. He taught criminal law to newly appointed judges from across Canada and instructed the Ontario Crown Attorneys Association, the Criminal Law Association, and the Ontario Bar Association with their continuing education programs. Justice Moldaver is an honorary fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and most recently he received a Doctor of Laws honoreus causa from the University of Toronto in 2019. He retired on September 1st, 2022. Justice Moldaver is married to his wife, Ricky Moldaver. He has two daughters, Shannon and Jessica, as well as two grandchildren. So please welcome me, sorry, please join me in welcoming <laughs> Justice Moldaver and thank you for welcoming me as well. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to shake your hand or not. I didn't know whether to use this one or that. Before I get going, I just want to give you a little word of explanation. This is not a costume I'm preparing to wear for Halloween. <clears throat> and I was thinking today that I got through 11 years on the Supreme Court where there's a lot of body checking and piling on and I came out completely unscathed. I retire for six weeks <laughs> and I end up breaking a bone in my shoulder. I could have said I shouldn't have retired, but it was time. It's clearly time, and you'll see that by the time I finish this uh, little lecture. Um, anyways, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you for those lovely, lovely remarks, um, and, uh, you know, overly generous and kind remarks. Uh, they really are. Um, this is um, a privilege for me. Uh, I'm grateful to Dean Philipson, who is not here, and the members of the Speaker's Committee uh, for inviting me to deliver this year's Culloden Lecture in Criminal Law, um, and uh, I'm most appreciative. I'm sorry that the Dean could not be here, but um, I almost didn't make it either, so. <laughs> 
I also want to say a special word of thanks to Katie Richard, who coordinated this event. I don't know if you're still here, Katie, or not, but yeah, there you are. Uh, thank you so much for your dedication and commitment and for the kindness and thoughtfulness you've shown me uh, throughout this process. So I'm very grateful to you. Um, this is a great university. It's a great law school. In fact, in my view, it's one of this country's most esteemed and prestigious law faculty. Sorry about the U of T colleague that's sitting here. <laughs> we come a close second. <laughs> and it's a faculty which, among other things, has favored the Supreme Court of Canada over the years with outstanding law clerks including Mackenzie Stewart. I don't know if any of you know Mackenzie, but she is clerking with me and my successor, uh, Justice Obonsawan, this year. And to Mackenzie's good fortune, she'll be working primarily with Justice Obonsawan because <laughs> I have one foot out the door already. George, much as I am deeply grateful for the kind introduction, um, and overly generous remarks, I must say. First of all, it makes me feel old. That's, <laughs> but, uh, I have to tell you from a personal perspective, when you cut through the CV and the fluff and the fanfare and the hoopla that goes with it, at bottom, I'm just a kid from Peterborough that got lucky. I'm a kid from Peterborough, Ontario, that got lucky. And today I feel particularly lucky, and I wanted also to, before I actually launch into the Culloden Lecture, to thank my judicial colleagues who are here today, former colleagues, I guess it is. Um, uh, I'm very grateful to you for taking time out of your busy schedules, and I don't want to center the Chief Justice, but I'm going to because he has become a dear friend, Chief Justice, and it's always a pleasure to see you you welcomed Ricky and I so wonderfully well last summer, and uh, I'm just delighted to be able to come back to Saskatoon and uh, see you and Kirsten later on tonight, And but thank you all very, very much for coming and being here today. I appreciate it. But I feel particularly lucky today to deliver the Culloden Lecture in Criminal Law <clears throat> in honor of one of Saskatchewan's most preeminent and distinguished, if not revered, uh, Chief Justices, the Honorable Edward Milton Culloden. Sadly, I did not know the late Chief Justice, and I say sadly because from what I can make out, <clears throat> I would have liked him a lot. He's been described as a man of great courage, leadership, and vision, who dedicated his every waking moment as Chief Justice, an office he held from 1961 to 1981, to upholding the rule of law and striving to achieve what he, in his own words, described as the basic question which faces every court, namely, and I quote, doing what is necessary to see that justice is done, end quote. In this, he succeeded mightily. Indeed, to many, his name is synonymous with justice in Saskatchewan. Others point out that despite his high office, he never lost sight of his humble beginnings. Growing up as he did on a farm in Elbow, Saskatchewan, throughout his distinguished judicial career which spanned some 30 years on the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, 20 as Chief Justice, he was known as a humble and modest man who treated everyone equally with respect and dignity and who wrote his judgments for the people he was called upon to serve. And by all accounts, he had a keen understanding of the human condition and his judgments displayed the kind of simplicity, clarity, common sense, and good judgment that are the hallmarks of a truly great judge. 
and he was a truly great judge, and he was a truly great human being, and he was a truly great Canadian. And in the spirit of Chief Justice Culloden, the lecture I am about to give, as you will soon see, is not a fancy lecture. It's not filled with legal jargon or intellectual niceties. In fact, it's devoid of these things. Let's see a few more smiles, okay? <laughs> Rather, it's a lecture geared to a Chief Justice who understood that the practice of law and the practice of criminal law in particular for which he exhibited a special passion is a very human process, a process that deals with real live human beings who have real life problems that require real life solutions. So let's get at it. A few minutes ago I told you that I was just a kid from Peterborough who got lucky, and that's true. Indeed, as it happens, just being born and raised in Peterborough was my first stroke of good luck. And with your permission, I want to just take a few moments and explain why. When I think back to my formative years in Peterborough, I'm struck by the thought that life seemed so much simpler then. People were friendly, and everybody seemed to know everybody. There were no blackberries or blueberries or raspberries or iPhones or iPads. People actually communicated with one another face to face. They were more than just lines on a screen that you could erase with the flick of a finger. Most of the people I knew were not wealthy, <clears throat> but they were comfortable and seemed happy. Neighbors were actually neighborly. They were friends who you could count on. They were friends who were there in good times and bad. <clears throat> and other memories of my upbringing in Peterborough come to mind. For example, the doors of our home were never locked. My dad always left the keys to his car in the ignition every night. At age five, I was walking to and from school about three quarters of a mile each way. My mother was not irresponsible or uncaring, I assure you. In fact, she was one of the most loving, caring mothers in the whole world. But knowing what she did, she had a sixth sense that everything would be okay and that I would be safe. And it turned out she was right. I wish she had been with me last week when I was walking across Bay Street and went head over heels that ended up with this. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's the, that is the world that I was raised in, and I, we like to use this word context in the Supreme Court of Canada. That, if you will, was my context. And I came away from it believing that people are basically good and decent and honest, and I came away believing that what most people want in life is to be able to live out their lives in peace and harmony, and I came away understanding that what most people need in life is not so much material things, but to have a sense of self-worth and to be treated fairly as equals with respect and dignity. That, by the way, is the wording in part that my two brothers and I chose to mark our late father's headstone. Dad is buried in Peterborough. His headstone reads in full as follows. Live each day to the fullest and respect the worth and dignity of every human being. As will be apparent, my upbringing in Peterborough went a long way towards shaping my outlook on life and my perception of human beings and the human condition. It also shaped the views and attitudes and beliefs that have influenced me throughout my career, initially as a criminal defense counsel and latterly as a judge. And believe it or not, it also played a significant role in my becoming a criminal defense counsel. Why? Because there was really nothing to do in Peterborough, certainly nothing much at nights. And so me and my family sat down every night and we watched a lot of TV. And one of the programs which we watched religiously week in and week out for a number of years was a show called Perry Mason. 
Now, I don't know how many, you remember it. <laughs> Chief Justice, good. I'm glad there's one of us. <laughs> but um, some of you may remember Perry Mason, but for those who are too young, he was a defense counsel without equal. Every week, he acted for a different innocent person charged with murder, and every week his client walked free. He never lost a case. At about the 50-minute mark of each episode, in the course of a picture-perfect cross-examination, he would extract a confession from the real culprit, <laughs> and his client would be set free. Life was beautiful, and I wanted a piece of it. I was seven years old at the time. <laughs> My appetite for criminal law grew even greater when I went to law school. Day in and day out, we would learn about cases involving monumental issues of criminal law or evidence that had made their way to the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court of Canada. And while I didn't think much of it at the time, it dawned on me in later years that when reviewing these great legal treatises from the higher courts, no one seemed to care much about the trial court decision. The facts of the case didn't seem to matter very much. It was the, it, I mean, if they were in the head note, that's fine. But uh, if not, who cared? It was the great, great point of law that was at issue. That's what really mattered. Flashy trials every week, great points of law, day in and day out. Criminal law was definitely for me, and I went for it. And I'm glad I did. Some of you may be tempted to do the same, and I hope you will. <clears throat> but before you do, I want to have a little talk with you. <laughs> I do so not to deter you from practicing criminal law, but to give you a slightly more realistic view of it than the Perry Mason one that I had going in. I call this little part of my talk, and you'll forgive me for this, Perry tales can come true. <laughs> they can happen to you. <laughs> but I wouldn't bet the farm on it. <laughs> I started practicing criminal law in the spring of 1973, and before too long I had my first client. His name was Kenny F. Now I use his initials not to protect the innocent, but to protect myself. <laughs> If Kenny knew I was talking about him, even to this day, he'd probably come after me. And I wouldn't want that. <laughs> See, Kenny was a rounder. And by that, I don't mean that he was well-rounded. Rather, he'd been, a, he'd, he'd been accused of virtually every crime in the criminal code by the time uh, he uh, came to me. And <laughs> word has it that he actually came to me I'll step back. He had a criminal record that, st that stretched from here to Vancouver and back. That'll give you an idea of my first client. This time, Kenny was charged with uttering counterfeit money. And a cursory, cursory review of his record led me to conclude that this was about the only crime in the entire criminal code <laughs> for which he had not already been convicted. And that was upsetting to Kenny. Word has it that he hired me as a lawyer to help fill in the gap. <laughs> Kenny's instructions to me were simple. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not fooling you about this. This is my first client in the first case. His instructions to me were simple, if not elegant. Quotes, I don't want to go down, quotes, he said. But if I do, it's no big deal. Just make sure I don't get sent to the reformatory. Reformatories are for sissies. If I go down, you make sure I go to the penitentiary, or else. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, off we went to trial, and the sole issue in the case was identity. Could the Crown prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Kenny was the guy that was passing the phony $50 bills? The trial started off fine, and everything was going well until the afternoon of the second day. On the stand was a merchant who had been built and he uh, was about, I knew this, he was about to, to identify Kenny as the bilker. And just as the Crown was about to ask him if he could identify the person who had passed the phony bills, the trial judge interrupted and said, Mr. Moldaver, you may want to have a word with your client. At which point I turned around and there was Kenny, 
sound asleep in the prisoner's dock. <laughs> it was really quite touching. <laughs> in my whole life, I'd never seen anyone sleeping quite so peacefully. <laughs> of course, Kenny had good cause to be exhausted. The trial was being held in a small community about 100 kilometers north of Toronto, and we were all staying in a hotel. And every night, a group of Kenny's friends from Toronto would travel to be with him and provide him with the kind of moral support he so desperately craved. <laughs> and Kenny and his buddies would party the night away. And every night, Kenny would ask me to join him. And every night, I would say no, except for the last night of the trial, <clears throat> after I'd completed my closing submissions and there was really nothing left to do. That night, I decided to take Kenny up on his offer, and I went to his room. Knocked on his door, the door opened, and I could hardly see inside. A cloud of smoke filled the room, and I stuck my head in, but before I go any further, I want you to know something. And remember this, I did not inhale. <laughs> I did not <laughs> inhale. One thing is sure, whatever kind of smoke that was, I knew it wasn't smoke of the cigarette kind. <laughs> So I thanked the guy who opened the door, told him that I'd got the wrong, uh, wrong room, and headed back to my room. Poor old Kenny, you know. He was a man ahead of his times. He knew full well that some way, someday, what was going on in his room that night would be perfectly legal. <laughs> what a visionary he was. <laughs> That was 1973, 45 years later in 2018, he was proved right. And for those of you who may be wondering whether I would have gone into that room were the trial being held today, the answer is simple. Keep on wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Some things in life are never meant to be revealed. Anyways, back to the trial. The next day, Kenny was convicted. And if that wasn't bad enough, the trial judge sentenced him to 18 months in the reformatory. <laughs> Kenny was furious, absolutely furious. He immediately filed a prisoner's notice of appeal, not against conviction, mind you, but against sentence. Of the several grounds he raised, one stands out in my memory. My lawyer was incompetent. He promised to get me pen time, and look what happened. <laughs> And the prayer for relief in his notice was the best. It went like this. Please get me out of the reformatory and send me to the pen. If you don't, I'll never live it down. <laughs> Good old Kenny, my first real client and my first real trial. Not quite the Perry Mason model I had in mind. And after a few more experiences of that nature, it began to dawn on me that the Perry Mason myth was just that, a myth. And that going to trial was not a fun thing. And my motto soon became, stay out of court as much as possible. Do not go to trial unless there is no other viable option. And some looked down on me, and some accused me of being afraid of going to trial. And you know what? They were absolutely right. The truth is, if you care about what you're doing, going to trial is not a fun experience. <clears throat> The pressures can be enormous. Indeed, whenever I had a big trial, I came away feeling that I had lost a piece of myself in the courtroom, win, lose, or draw. And you will understand what I mean <clears throat> when you defend your first murder case, knowing that your client may go to jail for the rest of their life. And you will understand what I mean when you defend a truck driver who will lose his livelihood if he's convicted of impaired driving. And you will understand what I mean when you defend a mother who will lose her child if she's convicted of child abuse. And you will quickly come to realize that one of the big problems with going to trial is that there is no certainty in the courtroom. Remember that, there is no certainty in the courtroom. Whenever I was doing a big case, I would wake up every morning with butterflies in my stomach, and I would want to pull the covers over my head 
and I would think to myself, if only I'd gone into dentistry. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against dentists. Actually, I'm not crazy about them, but I've got nothing <laughs> against them. But I mean no, no disrespect when I compare and contrast the work they do with the work that trial lawyers do. And the simple truth is this. If the dentist has a modicum of skill and does a little bit of preparation, chances are they're going to beat the tooth. In fact, I'd put it about, the odds at about 99 to 1. Not so as a trial lawyer. <clears throat> There's no certainty in the courtroom. You can prepare to the nth degree and put on a sparkling performance and still lose. <clears throat> and if you care about what you're doing, you will anguish over your losses much more than you will luxuriate in your wins. I sure did. Whenever I suffered a loss, I'd be down on myself for days and weeks and sometimes months at a time. You wouldn't know it if you passed me on the street. I'd smile and I'd try and keep a stiff upper lip. I wasn't about to wear my heart on my sleeve. But in the peace and quiet and serenity of my home, night after night I would pace the halls and sometimes kick the walls, all the while wondering what could I have done? What should I have done? Where did I fall down? Where did I go wrong? Have I lost it? Can I ever go back into the courtroom? And on and on and on. One year stands out for me. It was a particularly bad year. I lost two murder cases back to back in the space of several months. In the first one, I gave what I thought was a particularly compelling closing address, and the jury was out for six days. The stress was palpable, and when the jury came back and convicted my client <clears throat> of murder, I saw tears in the eyes of two of the jurors, and I thought to myself, it was that, if it was that difficult, why didn't you just hold out? A hung jury would have been far better than a murder conviction. In the second one, my client was charged with two counts of second-degree murder. He had bludgeoned his wife and 12-year-old daughter to death in the kitchen of their family home. Once they were dead, he drove their bodies to a deserted location and staged the scene to make it look like they had been sexually assaulted and robbed. He then returned home, cleaned up the kitchen, called the police, and in a frantic voice said that his wife and daughter were missing. At trial, he admitted to the killings, but claimed he had acted in self-defense. The jury was not impressed, and they convicted him of two counts of second-degree murder. The trial judge then sent the jury out. Here's the good part. The trial judge sent the jury out to consider whether the minimum period of parole ineligibility should be increased from 10 years up to and including 25 years. The jury was no sooner out, and they were back. Couldn't have taken them more than 10 minutes. I figured they'd had enough and just wanted to go home and that they were going to either make no recommendation or just leave it at 10 years. The foreman stood up, and in a voice cold as stone, he announced, we are unanimous, my lord, 25 years on each count. 25 years on each count. And the thought crossed my mind, way to go, Mikey. <laughs> that was one of my finer moments in the courtroom. I had managed to turn two counts of second-degree murder into two counts, the effectively two counts of first-degree murder, uh, all on my own. <laughs> and that was another client off to the penitentiary for life, two in the space of a few months. It got so bad at one point, I thought they were going to name a wing at Millhaven after me. <laughs> In fact, I'm convinced that that's why the federal government appointed me to the trial bench. The cost of paying me a judge's salary paled in comparison to the cost of building a new wing at Millhaven <laughs> to, to house my clients. You know, I can smile about these things now, but at the time, they were no laughing matter. Perhaps you will now appreciate why I wanted to stay out of the court as much as possible. Fortunately, in my case, that didn't prove too difficult. The reason is simple. 
because most of the people who walked into my office were guilty of something. They may not have been guilty of the offense for which they were charged, but they were guilty of something. And there were no great legal issues involved, and there were no Perry Mason-like trials on the horizon. My task, for the most part, was to obtain for my clients the best possible sentence I could. And that often meant trying to get them the help they needed to overcome the problem or problems that had led them to their involvement in the criminal law in the first place. And some viewed me as being more of a social worker than a criminal lawyer, and I was. And I make no apologies for it. The criminal process can be devastating. And I spent much of my time, time to keep my clients as sane and normal throughout the process as possible. And make no mistake about it. The fears and stresses that accompany the criminal law process can, and often do, go well beyond the ultimate fear of going to jail. That's the big one, clearly. But others include fear of losing your spouse and family, fear of losing your friends and associate, fear of losing your job or business. Lines of credit tend to dry up when someone is charged with a criminal offense. Fear of going to a restaurant or movie or a movie lest someone point an accusing finger. Fear of picking up a newspaper or going online only to discover that someone charged with a similar crime has been sentenced to seven years in the penitentiary. Fear of, fear, fear of seeing the hurt in your children's eyes when they come home from school having been cruelly tormented by other children. Your daddy's a criminal. Your daddy's going to jail. A fear of the unknown. What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? Will it happen? Will the police and the Crown accept a plea to a lesser charge? Will the judge go along with a joint submission? Will I be able to take the witness stand? I only have a grade eight education and I've never before spoken publicly, let alone to a jury of 12 people in a courtroom filled with strangers. Will I be able to withstand a heated cross-examination? Or will I get tripped up and fall apart even though I know I'm not guilty? And more generally, waking up every morning not knowing whether you will have the inner strength to withstand the anxieties and stresses and pressures of the criminal justice system. Now, why am I telling you these things? Well, there's two reasons. The first one's obvious. Um, there's more to the practice of criminal law than trying high visibility cases and arguing great points of law, much more. The second is perhaps a little less apparent. The criminal law is a very human process. We're not dealing with robots or automatons, but with real live people who have real life problems that invariably go beyond their immediate problem with the law. And in your capacity as a criminal lawyer, you will have the opportunity to help people in need. And your reward will come in knowing that you are able to make a real and lasting difference in the lives of some, not all, but some. In certain cases, the, war, the reward will be immediate and obvious. In successfully defending against a charge of murder, <clears throat> you will have spared someone the prospect of sending, spending the rest of their life in prison. In the case of a young person who has come from a broken home and is heavily involved in drugs by age 16, you may be able to get them the help they need to get their life in order and to go on to become a productive and responsible member of society. In the case of a historical sexual assault victim who has had the courage to come forward and confront their assailant, you may, be, you may be able to guide and assist them through the process and help them keep their strength and sanity as they undergo the rigors of a criminal trial. 
These, I suggest, are but a few of the ways in which criminal lawyers can make a difference in people's lives. But I would be remiss if I were to leave you with the impression that it is only criminal lawyers who make such differences. The truth is that all lawyers can. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to just take the last few minutes of this talk to share with you three thoughts that I hope will stand you in good stead no matter what area of law you may practice in. First, as you begin your careers as young lawyers, it is particularly important to remember that there's more to being a good lawyer than winning and losing. There's more to being a good lawyer than winning and losing, much more. My late partner, Eddie Greenspan, made his reputation in the Peter Demeter case, a case that he lost at every level of court all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. But the fact that he lost was not foremost in people's minds. Indeed, it counted for very little. What mattered was how he had played the game, how he played the game. That's what mattered, and the same applies to you. And that brings me directly to my second point, which is your reputation. At the end of the day, the success you achieve as a lawyer will not be measured by the number of wins you have had or the amount of cash you've been able to accumulate. It will be measured instead by your good name. It will be measured instead by how you played the game. And it will be measured by the respect you have earned from your colleagues, from the judiciary, from your clients, and from the community at large. So as you embark upon your careers, please remember this. Your reputation is your most important asset. It takes a long time to build up, and you can lose it overnight. Your reputation is your most important asset. It takes a long time to build up, and you can lose it overnight. So keep your guard up. Don't ever let it down. More pointedly, don't let yourself down. Let your word be your bond. Let honesty and integrity be your guideposts. Treat people with respect and courtesy. Recognize the worth and dignity of every human being. Be firm when necessary, but never impolite or belligerent. Be tolerant of everything but intolerance. And if you practice as a litigator, set a good example in the courtroom. Craft your written work with care and pride. Come to the courtroom fully prepared. Try not to waste the court's time. Get down to the issues. Make your arguments that are grounded in sound reasoning, common sense, and an understanding of the human condition. These, I believe, are some of the qualities that go into the making of a truly great lawyer. And finally, my third point. For those of you who may be looking at me and thinking I wish I were him, let me assure you that him is looking at you (laughs) and wishing he were you. (laughs) The message, be yourselves, enjoy the moment, enjoy what you have, live each day, and live life to the fullest. You have your whole life ahead of you. And each of you has the opportunity to do great good. And when I speak of great good, I'm not talking about arguing some landmark case in the Supreme Court or writing learned treatises of law or defending some high-profile murder case or some corporate giant. I'm not talking about those things. Rather, I'm talking about little things that generally go unnoticed. I'm talking about small measures that can make an immeasurable difference in people's lives. I'm talking about helping little people who have been victimized by others more powerful, advising them of the rights and freedoms and benefits to which they are entitled, providing them with a voice so that they can access the justice system, a system which many find daunting and foreign and hostile. In sum, when I speak of doing great good, I'm talking about just helping ordinary people in their daily lives, 
helping them weave their way through the thicket of rules and regulations that govern our daily activities, be it the purchase of a home, the incorporation of a business, the payment of taxes, or the fair treatment of employees. As lawyers, you will have the opportunity to do great good every day. And as corny as this may sound, my simple view of life is this. The things we do today become the memories of tomorrow. The things we do today become the memories of tomorrow. So if you want to have good memories, it's simple. Just do good things. In my case, doing great good comes in the form of a statute that I have in my office at home. It's not much of a statue. It stands about a foot and a half tall, and it's made from plastic with a granite base. I got it from a woman who killed her abusive husband to save her life. She was charged with murder, and thankfully, the jury acquitted her on the basis of self-defense. And the case attracted no publicity, no fame, no notoriety. There was barely a soul in the courtroom when the verdict was announced. And I believe I was paid the grand total of $3,000 for legal aid for defending her on this murder charge. The statue itself probably cost her $25 or $30. But to me, it's priceless. To me, it's priceless. And for me, it's what made it all worthwhile. Then, and even to this very day. Thank you so much. So uh, it's 12.47, so we have um, almost 10 minutes for questions, so that way we still have time to uh, wrap up. Um, if you have a question, please go to the, one of the mics. Okay. You don't have to. Yeah, we don't have to. You can get out. Um, no, nobody has. Oh, there's one. Just state your name and then, and then your question. Uh, my name is Fakiha. Uh, my question is about emotions and working with clients. You were saying how you, were, you, were, you would be kind of stressed out in private. Were there any kind of methods that you came up with to kind of separate your emotions from your work, or is that just kind of an ongoing thing that was just a reality? Um, and the second question was about the stigma that clients face, especially, for example, somebody who's falsely accused and reintegrating into society. So where do you think the legal system can step in to help counter the stigma that people face? All right, let's deal with the first one okay. first, okay? And then I may ask you to repeat the second one because I wasn't exactly sure what you said. But, but the first one, uh, if I tell you that when I went to the Supreme Court of Canada, I still woke up with butterflies every day. And my life there for the past 11 years has been one where virtually every day at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, if my wife still feels she'll, she'll confirm this, but I wake up and, and my mind gets going and I can't get back to sleep and I worry about the cases and are we doing right and... You know, am I going to lose this five to four and so that I'll just be writing prose or will someone come with me and be, I'll be writing the law, you know? And, and it was a continuous, continuous feelings of anxiety and stress for me. I'm not talking about others, I'm just talking about me. And, and um, at one level, I wouldn't have it any other way because to me, it shows to my, for my own purposes, that I care. I care about what I'm doing. And if you care about what you're doing, then it's a lot harder, frankly, if you lose something than it is if you just feel that your job is there to have the I's dotted and T's crossed. So the simple truth is that I never, ever came overcame these anxieties. One might have thought by the time you get to the Supreme Court, you know, there shouldn't be a care in the world, believe me. <laughs> there were lots of cares in the world. And, um, and even as I start out in the next chapter of whatever career I might have, you know, I will be filled with trepidation because if I go back into some sort of practice, I haven't practiced for 32 years. 
and I have little sense of what's going on out there. So there's going to be a lot of sleepless nights even in that. I, I just say this. It's important to understand that it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to wake up in the morning with butterflies. Get your feet on the ground, get up and get going. But so long as it doesn't consume you, so long as it doesn't cause you to have a breakdown, uh, a, some fear is good, in my view. It, it causes you to get up on things and be right on top of your game. I'm convinced that when I used to do murder trials in the courtroom, if someone were to come along and take a pint of my blood, they'd, they'd, it wouldn't be blood, it would be pure adrenaline. And that's the way it was, you know? So I hope that answers the question. I, I, everybody's different. I'm not trying to tell anybody what works best for them. I'm just talking about me. And I say it's okay to be afraid. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? as long as it doesn't consume you. And, sorry, the second question, I'm just quite... Stigmatization of the body. The which? Uh, was the it was about stigma and like kind of reintegrating to society, especially, like, for example, you were talking about children who might be facing bullying because of their parent uh, going to trial. So what, what, what can the legal system do to support people? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, there are certain realities in society. <laughs> there, there are certain unhappy things that go on in our society. And in terms of the stigma and so on, um, that, I, I guess what I was trying to say to you is, is that I was, I was trying to disabuse you of the concept that being a criminal lawyer is just going to trial and having these great trials and, you know, and getting the client off and everything is wonderful. There's so much that goes on between the time of the charge and the time of the trial, if you actually go to trial. And I did, I used to spend oodles of time trying to keep my clients as sane and normal throughout that process, because there is a stigma when someone's charged with a criminal offense. You know, I'm not talking about a theft under, although even then, if you're a bank account, if you're a bank uh, teller, there's a problem, right? So, so that's just the nature of our society. But I think it's important for the people who have been charged, if you care about what you're doing, and if you take on their case, to let them know that there's one person really in the world that does care and that is their friend and that is going to be with them and behind them and supportive of them throughout. And that's vital. I don't know whether that answers anything or not. It's not a perfect world by any means. And yeah. Up to the mic and your name, and then this will be the last one because we only have seven minutes left. And if it's too tough, it may be the last one, period. I mean, <laughs> I may not respond to it. When you were sitting on the Supreme Court, what was the biggest pet peeve you found counsel would do that would undermine their case? What is the biggest test? Like, biggest pet peeve you had that lawyers would do to oh, undermine their case? Yeah. Well, that's a, that could be a very long, long answer. <laughs> but <laughs> um, You know, it's funny. I used to feel bad for particularly the younger lawyers who came into the Supreme Court, but even seasoned lawyers, you know, when those big doors open and some guy yells out, La Cour! You know, I mean, I just about fainted, you know, <laughs> and I was on the other side of the door. So you can only imagine what it feels like if you're in the courtroom, and particularly if you are a young lawyer who is there for the first time. And there were times I wanted to just go and get off the bench and go and put my arm around them and say, hey, look, take a breath. You know this case better than any one of us up there, okay? And we're not out here to hurt you. We're not out here to embarrass you. We're not out here to belittle you. We need your help. We need your help. So take a breath, calm down, and just do the very best you can. In terms of what you shouldn't be doing, you know, there are certain never-nevers. Never mislead the court. Certainly don't do it purposefully. Okay? Never, never, never. Your word should be your bond. Okay? And sometimes lawyers get themselves into trouble by taking what I call an ostrich approach. They don't want to deal with the matters that are really troublesome, the bad facts, the bad issues of law, so they ignore them. Believe me, when you're in front of nine of us, <laughs> 
you know, the ostrich approach ain't going to work. <laughs> Somebody's going to get you <laughs> sooner than later. <laughs> so, so that's part of it too. Just be totally, l l when we read your material, we want to come away with an understanding and a belief that we can take the written material that you've given us to the bank. And we don't want to find out that you've given us a bunch of authorities that are, have been overruled you know, or are really not even close to being on point, okay? That kind of thing. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't even know how to, s in terms of oral argument, for example, you know, somebody's got an hour. I always tell them, prepare for half an hour. Don't prepare for an hour, because you're gonna get quizzed by nine judges. And if you've only got an hour and you prepare for an hour, half of what you've prepared is going to go down the tubes. You can use it for kindling that night to light the fire, you know. So, and also, don't feel that you have to go on if you've got an hour, that you feel you have to go on for the whole hour. If you're finished your points in 45 minutes, so just say to the court, you know, uh, unless you have any other questions, those are my respectful submissions, and sit down. The court will love you. <laughs> They'll be able to get out for lunch a little bit quicker. And it's the same with factums. The same with factums. You get 40 pages in, our, in the court, Supreme Court. And my litmus test was any factum over, th first of all, if you give me one that's 25, you, you're way up there in my books, right, to begin with. Because we are reading for any given case, sometimes five, 600 pages for one case, and we got four of them on, or five of them that week. So we're not looking to have 40 pages that's filled with fluff. We'd just like you to get down to the issues and do it clearly and simply and in a comprehensive but understandable fashion. And so if you can do your factum in 20 pages as, a, as opposed to 40, do it. Don't feel that you gotta fill the 40 pages. And again, my litmus test for any factum over 30 pages was how many times do I have to go to the fridge before I get through reading it for the first time? <laughs> and if it's more than three, you're in big trouble. <laughs> the only other thing I would tell you is this. If you're arguing in front of the Supreme Court and the court asks you no questions, here's the big tip of the day. You've either got a sure winner or a sure loser. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Okay, good. Don't, don't go too far. Oh. Uh, Nisha is going to come up and provide you with a, a small uh, token of thanks. Um, on behalf of all the students and staff at the College of Law, we wanted to thank you for coming out today. Um, we really uh, loved hearing all about your shared experiences, and, it's, and honestly, you're very inspiring. <laughs> so, I, yeah, and thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we know it's snowy here, but... No, 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 it's great. I'm yeah. from Peterborough. Oh, yeah, it's a very good point. <laughs> but thank you so much thank for coming. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Once again, thank you, Justice. Um, and I would like to just remind everyone um, that our next lecture is a panel presentation as part of Access to Justice Week, and it's tomorrow, Tuesday, October 25th, in room 74, so over there. Uh, we do hope to see you there. Um, and next week, there is another lecture here in this room at 12 o'clock. Uh, and then just, you know, thank you, everyone, for coming out. It's you guys that help make this possible, um, and of course, well, the speaker, and thank you to McKercher, and I hope everybody have a, has a great, like, first snow day. <laughs>